Well, why don't we get started straight away? Uh, the format of the concurrent sessions is we'll have uh, 80 minutes, and each speaker will be divided into 40 minute session. We're going to try to enforce that rigidly to make sure that we have a fair distribution of time. Our first speaker in this session is Tony Erskine, who joins us from the University of New South Wales, and the topic of her presentation is Informal Associations, Joint Purpose of Action and Shared Responsibility, the Case of Coalitions of the Willing and the Responsibility to Protect. Sounds good. when their own governments fail to do so, and that this protection may, when necessary, involve military intervention. But which body or bodies can coherently be expected to discharge the proposed duty to safeguard those who lack protection of, or indeed who come under threat from, their own government? A particularly pressing context for this question arises when the United Nations is unwilling or unable to act, and there's no one state to fill the breach no agent of last resort to invoke Michael Walter's phrase, along with all of the controversy and the potential risks that he acknowledges reliance on this protection entails. This afternoon, I'm going to examine coalitions of the willing, or temporary, purpose-driven, self-selected collections of states, and sometimes non-state actors and intergovernmental organizations, as one likely provocative answer to the question, and explore how the informal nature of such associations both complicates and should inform the judgments of moral responsibility that we make in relation to them. Now my motivation for addressing this topic is really twofold. One, it's part of a larger project in which I've asked who or what are moral agents or bearers of duties in world politics. Although assigning moral responsibilities to formal organizations is something that I've argued is possible and crucial to do, I had dismissed as nonsensical any attempt to talk about moral responsibilities or the moral responsibilities of informal associations, by which I mean collectivities that lack established organizational and decision-making structures. And I'd had a nagging feeling that I'd been too hasty, a feeling that was aided by some persistent critics. The particular hard case of the Coalition of the Willing forced me to revisit and revise some earlier conclusions, and hopefully to start to think about moral responsibilities in relation to informal associations in a more sophisticated way. Now, the second motivating factor is what I think is the practical significance. Coalitions of the willing is a phrase that we hear invoked with frequency and often urgency in world politics, and significantly it's generally accompanied by claims to moral responsibility. Most recently, respective calls have been made to establish a coalition of the willing um, to advance the climate change agenda, and in the absence of UN Security Council approval, to put a halt to the crisis in Syria. The potential role and the normative status of coalitions of the willing has far-reaching consequences for how we assign and assume responsibilities and apportion blame in concrete cases. Yet it's unclear, to me anyway, how to speak coherently about assigning moral responsibilities and apportioning blame in relation to such ad hoc associations. Can coalitions of the willing be considered potential bearers of duties? Or alternatively, should our calls to action, and indeed our cries of condemnation in the wake of remedial action that stalled, ineffective, or deemed unjust, be directed towards their constituents? and their potential constituents. And if so, does the nature of informal associations, such as coalitions of the willing, affect our expectations of these constituents? Or, again, should our attention in the face of crises be redirected altogether towards more formal, permanent, and arguably legitimate organizations? So in the remaining 20 minutes or so, I'm going to do the following. First. I'm going to begin with what I've called a model of institutional moral agency, which was my starting point for arguing that moral responsibilities can be borne 
by formal organizations and maintaining that it's theoretically and practically problematic to talk about the moral responsibilities of informal associations. Second, I'm going to introduce the Coalition of the Willing as a hard case for this model and recount why this particular case has raised misgivings about my own rather stark distinction between formal organizations and informal associations if it means that accounts of moral responsibility must be reduced to the members or the potential members of such coalitions in a way that neglects the moral significance of their acting together. Third, I'm going to highlight some insights gained from the work of Virginia Held and Larry May and others, which I think has begun to contribute to a more nuanced argument about informal associations and questions of moral responsibility than I initially allowed. And finally, I'll suggest some particular implications of these insights for addressing how the widely endorsed duty to intervene to rescue vulnerable populations can be understood in relation to coalitions of the world. And I hope that you can hear me. My voice is failing slightly because I was on a plane for about 32 hours yesterday, so I apologize for that, um, but I'll try to keep it up. Now first, the model of institutional moral agency. I've argued that the assumption that only individual human beings can be moral agents is unnecessarily limiting. Such an assumption severely restricts often consequential assessments of moral responsibility in relation to some of the most pressing problems in world politics when prescriptions for actions and accounts of wrongdoing risk being incomplete, I argue, of directing only an individual human beings. Duty and blame in the context of certain acts and omissions, I've argued, seem more accurately attached to the organizations themselves. Adding to and elaborating on Peter French's account of conglomerate collectivities, also inspired by Honora O'Neill's thin theory of institutional agency, and more recently also influenced by the work of, among others, Philip Pettit and Christian List, I argue that collectivity qualifies as a moral agent if it has five characteristics. An identity that's more than the sum of identities of its constitutive parts, or what might be called a corporate identity, to a decision-making structure that can commit the group to a policy or course of action that's different from the individual positions of some or all of its members. Three, a mechanism by which group decisions can be translated into actions, thereby establishing with the previous criteria a capacity for purpose of action. The four, an identity over time, and fifth, the conception of itself as a unit meaning simply that it cannot be merely externally defined. And I refer to collectivities that meet these criteria, that are agents in and of themselves, and that possess sophisticated, integrated capacities of deliberation and action as institutional moral agents. Could you repeat number three and four? Number four and five, sorry? Mm -hmm. Number four and five, okay. Four and five. An identity over time. Um, and five, a conception of itself as a unit meaning simply that it can't be merely externally defined. And I go into slightly more detail of these in the paper, um, but really what I'm going to focus on is the ones that don't qualify. Okay. Collectivities in world politics that meet these criteria include, I've argued, most states, um, intergovernmental organizations, although often precariously, and multinational corporations, for example. They can be subject to the assignment of duties and the apportioning of blame in the context of particular acts and omissions in a way that's not reducible to their individual constituents as long as they enjoy the limited independence from other agents and structural constraints necessary to perform the requisite actions. So neither an individual nor an institutional moral agent can coherently be expected to discharge a duty if it's not capable of performing the requisite actions. But where I want to turn to is those collectivities that don't qualify according to my criteria. Nations assuming they lack their own political structures and decision-making capacities, protest movements, international society, the often invoked international community, and the even more amorphous collectivities such as the market, the media, and the internet. It does not make sense to talk about such collectivities as having moral responsibilities or to blame them for acts or omissions. And I've argued that prescriptions and evaluations of moral responsibility 
need to be directed instead towards the individual agents within these associations. And I've also placed coalitions of the willing into this category of collectivity that don't qualify. Now, turning to coalitions of the willing is a hard case. Coalitions of the willing, or the coalition of the willing, is a label that's used to designate a self-selected and often self-authorized constellation of states and sometimes of intergovernmental and non-state actors, such as regional alliances of states and private military corporations, respectively, that come together to respond to a specific crisis and in responding, act outside the control of any formal or overarching organization to which they might already belong. The members of the coalition of the willing are thereby temporarily united in pursuit of a common purpose, but the coalition itself lacks established organizational and decision-making and a decision-making structure. The label is most often used for associations that are summoned and established in cases of military intervention with or without UN authorization and frequently on proposed humanitarian grounds, but it's also applied in the context of single issue campaigns involving norm promotion. Returning in the paper to the criteria that I went through just a moment ago, I conclude that coalitions of the willing are made up of what I've identified as institutional moral agents, but they're not moral agents in themselves. For example, if we look at the decision-making criterion, and I go through all of the criteria in the paper, but I'll just focus on one for now, coalitions of the willing lack an overarching decision-making apparatus that can be said to direct the actions and represent the intentions of the collectivity as a whole. Rather than the formal decision-making of the so-called structured institutions, such as the UN, NATO, and all but failed states, which entails codified rules and established practices for arriving at policies, the coalition of the willing relies on negotiation, on bargaining, and consensus building among various constituents in the absence of existing organizational structures and decision-making procedures. There's no mechanism, I argue, for translating calls for collective action into decisions that are binding upon the group as a whole if such proposals depart from the positions of some of its members. Although the individual members of the coalition can carry out their respective decisions in order to coordinate their actions and can even choose to follow the instructions of a lead agent, they, the lack of a decision-making structure at the level of the coalition impedes corporate purpose of action. If we accept that there's a moral responsibility to protect vulnerable populations from mass atrocity, a claim that's become increasingly widely accepted, then the members of a coalition of the willing might have duties to take certain actions and might be blamed for inaction or acting disproportionately or indiscriminately. However, such prescriptions and evaluations must remain exclusively at the level of those agents that make up the temporary association. We can't coherently talk about assigning duties and apportioning blame to the coalition itself. So that's where I got to. And yet, upon arriving in that position, I had a number of related concerns that seemed to actually caution against treating coalitions of the willing as mere advocates of individual agents acting independently for the purposes of addressing questions of moral responsibility. One of these is that if attributions of moral responsibility must be directed towards individual states and possibly non-state and intergovernmental actors, rather than the ad hoc association they might come together to form, there will be some cases in which no state or other actor can be expected to discharge a particular duty to protect a population from egregious human rights violations, for example, simply because each, as a discrete agent, lacks either the capacities or the enabling conditions to do so. As I noted a few moments ago, a moral agent cannot be expected to discharge a duty if it's incapable of performing the requisite actions. And indeed, this apparent impasse is a reality in many cases in which vulnerable populations are facing mass atrocity. The designated moral agent of protection, the UN, is plagued by both external and internal practical constraints, which frequently make it impossible um, or make it incapable of actually acting 
The UN's reliance on resources from its member states, resources that are often not forthcoming, and the inadequacies of the decision-making structure of the UN Security Council, and I'm referring to the veto provision, are obstacles to it being able to discharge this delegated moral responsibility to protect. Moreover, even the most powerful states acting unilaterally often lack the capacities to effectively discharge the responsibility to protect vulnerable populations from mass atrocity. In such cases, we seem to have no choice but to concede that no agent can reasonably be burdened with a duty to act in response to the crisis, and this seems eminently unsatisfactory. If individual states and non-state and intergovernmental actors can accomplish things acting in concert that they cannot achieve when acting individually, this must somehow affect our judgments and moral responsibility in relation to them. And this was something that I was problematically overlooking, I think. This is where turning to theorists who have focused on moral responsibilities in relation to informal associations has been useful. And I'm going to touch on the work that Virginia held, and very quickly, um, Larry May, um, and Michael Bratman, but I realize I don't have a lot of time, so excuse me if I go through them rather quickly. But I will focus for a little bit longer on one of Hell's arguments. The question that Virginia Held set out to answer in an often cited 1970 article is reflected in its title, Can a Random Collection of Individuals Be Held Morally Responsible? The types of group that she holds up to scrutiny are those that contingently share a time and place but lack any specific decision-making procedures. For example, she looks at strangers who are walking down the street or unacquainted passengers on a train. Such collectivities fail to qualify as moral agents on each and every criteria that I offered a few moments ago. They also, I argue, stand in a potentially instructive relationship to the type of ad hoc coalition being addressed here. Now, Held makes two claims. First, she argues that in some circumstances, a random collection, or more accurately, those who make up the collection, may be held responsible for not acting. The specific circumstances in which she, they may be held responsible are those in which the following conditions are met. First, the individuals constituting the random collection were faced with a stranger in dire need of rescue and the gravity of the crisis demanded a response. Second, the individuals could have rescued the stranger by acting together, even though no one in the group could have done so acting independently. Third, the required action was obvious and the perceivable outcome was clearly favorable. And fourth, carrying out this action would have been possible without prior deliberation and special coordination between the individuals and would not have been open to disagreement. If all of the conditions were met, then the constituents of the random collection could have been held responsible for failing to act. As my aim is to see whether one might apply this logic at the international level, it's worth noting that the extent to which this final condition can be met when we're talking about discrete states rather than individual human beings is questionable. It's incredibly difficult to imagine a scenario in which collective action involving states would require neither prior deliberation nor special coordination. And this condition would therefore, it seems at first glance, shield individual states from any expectation that they engage in remedial collective action outside a pre-existing organizational structure. An exemption of this sort would have potentially tragic consequences in those cases in which no formal intergovernmental organization were willing or able to act to discharge the moral responsibility, such as the proposed imperative to protect vulnerable populations. The duty would thereby go unmet without any agent being vulnerable to the charge that it derogated from its moral responsibility to respond. However, before lamenting that random collections of states would be let off the hook if we apply health analysis, this application to international relations might be valuably pursued and the apparent leniency of this condition qualified in the context of Held's subsequent assertion. According to Held's second claim, 
even in cases in which a random collection cannot be held responsible for failing to perform an action, it may be held responsible for not forming itself into the type of group capable of deciding which action to take. The specific example that she constructs to convey this argument is worth relating. Hell describes, Hell describes three pedestrians who are strangers to each other, walking down an isolated street when a small building collapses. A man inside is trapped. He calls to the three for help. He's bleeding from a lower leg injury and needs immediate assistance. All four persons know that a tourniquet should be applied to the thigh, but this cannot be done until various beams are removed, and removing any would require the strength of all three. The three observers do not agree on how to proceed. Each person makes a different proposal. They argue, they do not act, and the man slowly bleeds to death. Held observes that any of their proposed actions would have saved the man, and a reasonable person should have known that any action would have been better than none. The problem, she argues, was deciding which to take. She concludes that we cannot hold the members of the random collection responsible for the non-performance of the action, given that acting would have required prior deliberation and special coordination. But they can be held responsible for failing to adopt a decision method and thereby transforming themselves into the sort of group that might have been capable of the consideration and coordination required for an effective response. Held's argument makes possible the following crucial insight with respect to the international case. When faced with a crisis, the gravity and imminence of which demands a response, even if remedial action would require both a multilateral effort on the part of available agents because of the limited capacities and the constraining conditions faced by each, and prior deliberation and special coordination between them because the requisite action is neither immediately obvious nor beyond disagreement. And even if these agents are not part of some pre-existing organizational structure that would facilitate such cooperation, there nevertheless remains a moral imperative for them to do something. Namely, they each have a duty to contribute to establishing the type of collectivity capable of the requisite collective action. Applying Held's argument to the international level, but with the crucial clarification <coughs> that loose organizational structures may be sufficient for the deliberation and coordination needed to support some form of collective action, leads to a potentially controversial, but I think compelling, suggestion. In the absence of a viable alternative, individual states and possibly non-state actors and intergovernmental actors have an obligation to contribute to establishing an informal temporary association for the purposes of responding to a particular crisis effectively, robustly, and in time to mitigate disaster. This seems especially persuasive in the worrying case where there's no formal organization, whether the UN or some other potential agent of justice, that can be expected to discharge its duty to respond, either because of external disenabling conditions or the agent's own limited capacities for deliberation and action, and no hope of reforming or creating one at the time needed for an effective response. And I'm going to leave it there, as I, um, because I know I've come to the end of my time. What I also do in the paper is in addition, in addition to looking at the expectations that we have of individual agents in the context of informal associations, I actually turn to the work of people like Larry May and more recently Michael Bratman um, to look at certain informal associations that are capable of what I call joint purpose of action. Um, I look at Bratman's work um, as well. Um, in this context, I argue that in these informal associations, individual agents have enhanced capacities, therefore they have magnified obligations, and we can actually expect more of these agents in the context of these informal associations than we would if they were acting independently or in isolation. So I've wrapped it up very quickly at the end, um, but in the context of questions, I can go through that in more detail. Thank you. We have a little under 15 minutes for uh, discussion and questions, and we ask that uh, when you uh, get a chance to speak, that you please identify yourself and you do your affiliation. So the queue is open. Uh, Bill Rouge, okay. So you've got this 
position whereby in response to crisis, individual uh, lots of collective agents have the responsibility to kind of coordinate all the coalition. Yes. Um, but it sounds as though you think that when you've got the coalition, that you shouldn't think of the coalition itself as a bearer of responsibilities. Okay. That's right. Um, but so, they do, but the agents within the association so have enhanced have, responsibility, yeah, okay. so it's not the same, it's just assuming that they're acting right, independently. Okay, okay. Um, so, I'm sort of reminded of some of the stuff in the sort of case in the literature about sort of individuals collecting, where you've got people like Stephanie Collins say, uh, you've got you know, individuals having a duty to collectivize yeah. and form a collective agent mm -hmm. that will then have. Sure. Um, and that's actually Virginia Held, um, one thing that I mentioned in the paper. She actually talks about um, these individuals coming together to form a formal organization. And yet I argue in the paper that she's actually gesturing towards something that's yeah, different. Yeah. yeah, okay. So um, here's something that I'm wondering about. Um, yeah. in, in the individual case, it's, well, it seems to me that it makes quite a lot of sense to see the thing the individuals come together to do yeah. as an obligation there. And one reason why I, I think well, the entity yeah, yeah. And one reason why I think that's true is because in cases like that, referring to the obligation of a collective mm -hmm. can be something that we can use to explain why particular individuals yeah. have the responsibilities they do in that context. Right? So yeah. why should I do this? Oh well, it's because this group here has this more general obligation, and in order to make it possible for it to do that, I've got to do my bit. That, that seems like an intelligible form of explanation that involves describing responsibility to the collective. So I'm wondering why, I wonder, I'm wondering whether that would make sense in the kind of international case. So what, why should Britain, for example, send its troops to so and so and so and so. Well, because we've all agreed that there is this crisis and each group has got to do its bit. Um, and the only way for the thing to be done is for each bit. Okay? So it seems as though you might want to explain the responsibilities of individual coalition members in terms of something. And it looks as though there's something that you're appealing to is the responsibility of the coalition. So what, what's wrong with that way of thinking about it? Because obviously that's, that's not the way that you want us to think. It's not, no. Um, and you asked me what's wrong with thinking like that when we get to the international level. But I, I actually mean, have trouble... Do you think there's something wrong with that at, at, at the individual, individual level? level? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I do think there's something wrong with it at the individual level. But I'm also concerned because I've gone from... I mean, the, the motivation for this paper was that I was missing something, that I wasn't looking at cases of joint action and um, shared cooperative activity. And there was something there that struck me as important that I was ignoring. Um, but I would argue, say if we go to the case um, that Philip has mentioned um, of people on a beach and somebody's drowning and they kind of all quickly come together to rescue the person. I would, in the context of what I'm arguing, think that they might have enhanced capacities in the context of that informal association because there might be a way that they can come together and achieve something that they couldn't do if they were acting independently. But I wouldn't talk about any entity other than the individuals having bearing that responsibility. Moral responsibility would still be distributed amongst the members of that sort of random collective over to use Virginia's health, health term. Do you yeah, are so, we going so, so, so to I, I, I suppose the question that I yeah. The, the question that I feel that I've got an answer to that I'm not sure whether you've got an answer to. Okay. So suppose a particular individual says, yeah. okay, um, why should, you know, here's this thing that you're telling me that I, I should do, but you know, why should I do that? Why, why should I? Mm -hmm. yeah? Now, one way that you might explain that mm -hmm. is to say, well, you know, here we are, and there's this problem that faces us that we have something to do, that we have to do something about. And for us to do something about it, you must do this. Mm 
Um, that, 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 that's an explanation that seems to involve referring to what we do. Okay, but responsibility but, is still distributed in some sense? Well, so, so, so I, I, think it, I think that a, a non-distributed responsibility explains the responsibility of each member. But I'm wondering what explains the responsibility on the top of you. I think the person says, what, why do I have to do this? I think then in the case, I mean, the case that I'm looking at at the international level, I think it's very clear and it's accepted that the individual states within the international community have a moral responsibility to respond to situations of mass atrocity. It's something that they've assumed in 2005 in the World Summit documents. So it's, there's that assumption that there is that moral responsibility. But if they have the capacity to discharge it, if they enjoy the enabling conditions that would allow them to do so. So there's that acceptance that there is that moral responsibility if there's a capacity to actually perform the requisite actions. Yes? Okay. Okay, so, so what this is, if I can, I should. If I can, I must. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and then we're in certain circumstances, <coughs> there are some cases when a state might be able to unilaterally respond, or the UN is there and can actually respond and is willing to do so. But what about cases when they simply can't because they're lacking the internal capacities or the enabling conditions? But my argument is then, if these states, the states which already recognize there is a duty to respond, can actually discharge this responsibility by acting collectively when they couldn't do so by acting independently, they have first an obligation to come together to form a sort of association that would allow them to then effectively respond and then to act in the context of that association. Going back to the individual case, I think that we can think of analogous situations where if there's a child drowning in the water, that I would think I do have a moral responsibility to save the child if I can. Okay? Perhaps I can't because I'm not a good enough swimmer. I need someone to hold me so I can reach in and grab the child. But the individuals involved in the situation would each think if they can save the child, they have a moral responsibility to do so. Okay? So that's already accepted. And therefore, if what they need to do is come together and form some sort of informal association to do it, they have the moral responsibility to take that first step and then act in concert. Does that answer your question? Yeah, do you see yeah, where yeah, it's this gap? Yeah. And I talk about it in the paper as shared responsibility. And by shared responsibility, I mean a responsibility that's necessarily distributed amongst the individual members of a collectivity for outcomes that can only be achieved when they act in concert. Um, yeah, I'm Nate McEwen, and somebody speaks about this, how that will comfort. And I'm a big fan of your work in institutional moral agency. Um, but I worry a little bit about using Virginia Hill's thought experiment in relation to states. Sure. And the reason is because, you know, there's a very important difference between individuals and states. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the power that states have. Sure. Um, so I worry about saying that states have a moral responsibility to organize the decision-making structure to act in cases of international crisis, because some of those states might be acting just to exploit that crisis for their own gain, and then they can just say, oh, I'm acting in my moral responsibility to do this. Mm -hmm. And what you're arguing, essentially, is that they should create an illegitimate, unauthorized, unaccountable decision-making structure. Um, and I find that very difficult to accept. I think there needs to be a pre-institutional structure there organized coalitions of willing. Yeah. So there is some kind of accountability and I can just say, oh, this is our moral obligation and we're entitled to do this. Yeah. No, I think that's an excellent point. And it's one that I try to acknowledge in the paper, not something that I've gone through here. Um, but I actually talk about what I call vigilante coalitions of the willing. So these are coalitions of the willing that are not authorized by the UN Security Council. And that is, that is problematic. Um, but I want to argue that in certain cases, if there's no viable alternative, and um, there is a situation that we recognize is generating a duty, that, that something has to be done, even if it's not, if it's an imperfect alternative, because the UN's unwilling or unable to act. What I do when I get to the end of the paper, I acknowledge that this can be manipulated um, by states, and that's a danger. And the solution for me is to institutionalize in some respect if the UN is unwilling or unable to act because, for example, there's a stalemate in the 
Security Council, then under these conditions, it might be legitimate for a coalition if they're willing to come together and act, but there are certain guidelines. And I guess if we go back to the 2001 document, the responsibility to protect, that was acknowledged in a sense. So I don't want to say it's a free-for-all, um, but I also don't want to say that if the UN can't or won't act in certain circumstances, but we recognize that the Rwanda, for example, um, it's a case where we think there should, there should be, there is a duty um, to respond that, that there's some alternative. Does that make sense? But I do absolutely acknowledge the dangers that you're talking about. I've got three minutes and two persons on the please. Yeah, I'm, I'm Zach Hale, I'm speaking to Elspeth. Um, so thanks to the last question, I guess. Um, my, my thought is really, even if states aren't trying to exploit the situation, even if they're just actually in good faith, um, sure. you know, but then they come together and they have different ideas sure. about what required response is or how the how responsibilities are to be shared among them. Yes. Um, and so, you know, in, in the sort of, with, with, if you have an institutional moral agent, then you know, it's part of the binding decision making procedure. Whereas yeah. I worry with, with sort of coalitions are willing that, um, well, what's going to happen if they disagree? Everyone's probably going to walk away. And they also do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, I agree completely. Um, one of the, the final section in the paper makes the argument that this is the second best alternative, that what we should do if, in the immediate term, when we're faced with a crisis, um, and there's no alternative, then forming an ad hoc coalition um, to respond is something that we should do. Um, but in the medium to long term, what we need to do is create the circumstances where these crises don't happen, and we need to reform or, or build new formal agents of justice that are able to respond um, so that we don't need to resort to these second best alternatives. So I, I agree with you, um, but I still want to make the argument that there's um, an immediate, if transient, moral responsibility to do something in the case of these crises. Does that answer your question? Or at least? Sure, yeah, I mean, I'm sure I, I think something. you're right. I guess I agree with you is what I'm saying. We should probably uh, conclude this portion of our session. Um, we'll Great, thank you.